welcome to ask questions. We're going to look at the way forward. But today it's all about the, the victims of crime. And so let me introduce to you myself and my beautiful wife here next to me. Um, I'm not going to give you all this uh, heavy credentials, but unfortunately, this is what people want to know when you speak internationally. Who are you? Where do you come from? And so we are just thank God for this opportunity to come and share with you. And we are in partnership with the Department of Correctional Services since 1991. So I'm just going to ask Jenny to say a prayer for us as we will start. And welcome you all. Welcome everyone. May we have a beautiful and fruitful time in the time that's allocated to us. Let's just join together uh, with prayer. It is very, very um, great to see the interest. Uh, we live in a country where many people are complaining about crime and about how victims are being hurt. But great to see that there's people that's interested in being part of the solution. And so well done and a warm welcome to you. And let us just turn to God in prayer because he is the ultimate. Father, we thank you that we can once again uh, commit ourselves, our time, our day to you, Lord. Our concerns, Lord, we commit to you. Our purpose, we commit to you. We thank you, Lord, that your word teaches that we must commit our, everything to you and our plans will succeed. And so today, Lord, we pray um, uh, that you would be with us, that you would guide us. We pray, Lord, that this time that we will spend together, that it to many who need healing, many, Lord, who are hurting, many, Lord, who need to be uh, just lifted up, encouraged, and restored. That you would use this time that is invested in our lives, Lord, to become meaningful in the lives of those who need it most. And so bless us and guide us. And, and Lord, we are excited about the opportunities that you give us. And we want to make the most of this as your word encourages us to do. And so be with everybody that's part of this. And we thank you so much, Lord. May we experience the presence and the power of God even through this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Jenny. We really thank God for this opportunity to be with you all here. And I trust that uh, everybody can hear me and continue. We really ask people to put themselves on mute there because there are still some, some sound coming through there. So if, if you can uh, please look at that. Okay, so it's all right. Okay, so. We want you, uh, we're going to ask, we're going to ask Inga, uh, Inga is the personal assistant to Anne and Andrew, our operation directors. Um, she's going to do the name list and we want to ask you, the moment you hear your name, you can just shout justice and show your face. I know it's very difficult for George because otherwise Mr. Rampasad is going to run around there with his computer to, for everybody to, to come on, on, on the screen. So we will, we will understand the situation at George. So uh, Inga, do you mind to give us the name list and that people can just uh, confirm that they're there on this, on this Zoom? Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. The response to the training has been I have a very long list in front of me. So please be patient with me as I go through the list. Um, the first person is Inga Justice. And the second person, Brett. 
Yes, yes, I'm here. My camera's not working. Sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Luke, Luke Baker. Uh, yeah. Luke is here. Jeanette David, she sent her apology. And Didi's here as well. My wife's to see her. Hi, Didi. <laughs> Daniel, is Daniel Hartley with us? Okay, Patrick Peterson, Dawn Jackson sent her apologies as well. Is Paul from Alex Amelia Ludovic and Marco Ludovic? Hello. Hey. Good morning. Good morning, Justice. Ricardo, is Ricardo with us? Hi there, I'm here. Thank you. Amy October. Samantha Speak. I know Sharon's with us. I saw Sharon's name earlier. Sharon, are you with us? Mm -hmm. Ronwin David sends her apologies. Um, and then we have so many amazing DCS members with us, and I'm not going to mention all the names, but Southern Cape, are you with us? Yes, good morning, ma'am. Southern Cape is here. Mr. Rampasad and Mr. Ru. We have 25 participants as well. Yeah, so I can just the 25 names. <laughs> that is yes. amazing. Yes. Uh, you want me to read the 25 names? I can do that. But I think for time, let us proceed. Please, give me that list. I will do it for you now, ma'am. Mr. Calvinace, AB, Ms. Mrs. Abrams, NC, or Mr. Abrams, uh, Mrs. Abrams, then Sikal, Mapapa, Rabi, May, Kipidu, Makwaru, Dedricks, EM, um, Makilanda, Makanana, Class, Mrs. Abrams, um, Koza, Mr. LaRue, Mr. Kavi, Cindy, Mr. Fermak, Mr. Galant, Mr. Galant, um, Workbard, Dry, Black Note, and Ms. Dante. Ms. May and Ms. Dante. Those are the colleagues from the nine correctional centers um, from, from the Southern Cape Management Area. Um, with me is also Mr. Fermak, AC Corrections. He's sitting next to me. Uh, he's also sitting in, but he'll be in and out uh, as well. Thank, Thank you, you ma'am. And then we have Allendale with us as well, Mr. Vincent. Hello from Allendale, justice to all. Hey. <laughs> That's an exuberant greet. That's a wonderful greeting. <laughs> and then we have Neva with us as well. Justice. Hi, Neva. Thank you. Hi, Justice. <laughs> and Chantal Hall. All the way up, Boylan team with us. Hi, all, Justice. And we have Ashley Fry. Hi, all justice. Ruth Van Roy. Unfortunately, not here today. Apologies. Not yet. No problem. And then we have the Smith family. Is the Smith family Doug with us? Okay, 
And then we have Pastor Jenny Clayton. She prayed for us. Thank you so much. And Felicia Lamb. Justice. Um, Mackie. Justice. Eleanor. Justice. Oh, I love that. All three of you, justice in the one frame. Love that. <laughs> And then I know Joey Bell sends her apologies. Is Yvonne with us? Ray Hendrix. Inga Ray is on the thing. She's just trying to sort out some technical issues. No problem. Is Gail with us? Louise Peterson. Mr. Fortain from Western Tank. Justice. Thank you. Um, Andrew May is around. Justice. <laughs> and then we have, I have a revival center, but I don't have a name for revival center. So can somebody please let me know where the Bible Center is, where you're from. Hi. Hi there. Hi. Yeah, my name's Ricardo Sloster, so I don't know. It's probably because of the email address. But myself and John Napolis are, are sitting here at my office, um, and we're joining you for the Zoom there. So, so yeah, we are here. Ricardo Sloster Thanks. and John Napolis. Thank you so much. And then, and then I have a few names. I see a P40 light. Can I please get your name? Vanessa Paulson. Vanessa Paulson, nice to have you with us. And then there's another one. I saw someone with a different name, A21, I think. Galaxy A21. A, oh, sorry, Galaxy A01. Hi, Inga. It's Monica and Sinatembe here at the, at the Paulsmo office. Nice to see you guys. <laughs> and then if I haven't mentioned your name, please pop me a message in the chat group and I will get your name and email address and that I will send you the recording after the, the training. Thank you, Inga. We also have Reverend Franz from the uh, West Coast Management Area on board as well. Hello, Reverend Franz. Okay, um, let's continue, let's continue and welcome for those who just came on board and uh, we will uh, make sure that everybody gets on board. Um, I thought to, to, to play you a very short video clip of an introduction um, that was done um, when we did this training in Sweden and Dr. Orisa Fritzen from Sweden uh, that was chaplain at the time, she introduced us and I thought um, just to, to use her clip um, for you to know that uh, this victim offender dialogue uh, uh, training is uh, also international. So I'm just going to play you this, uh, this introduction. It's just a, a few seconds, actually. Sorry for that. And I was frustrated because in Sweden, our solution or response to crime is to serve your sentence. Then you are supposed to be free. And you go out in society as a free person. 
but you are not free from bullying, and that is a huge problem. And me and my family, we love love to travel, so we came across uh, Cape Town, and I phoned the prison chaplain in Cape Town and asked, "Hello, can I visit you and see how you are working with prisons, prisoners in South Africa?" And as the generous people you are, you said, of course, you're welcome. <laughs> and that was the first time I met Jonathan and Jenny Clayton. And since then, I am so grateful for everything you have taught me. You are my role models. And without you, I, haven't, I have nothing to say. I have not lost any word on my own because I have, I have, you have taught me everything I know. I just want to mention also that Dr. Ulrika Fritzen um, received a PhD in 2019 uh, after spending almost nine years every year, three times a year at Paul Small coming to observe our restorative justice and her thesis was all about guilt and uh, the Department of Correctional Services gave her permission to do a research on this project and there is now a book in Europe out on this restorative justice and victim offender dialogue process. And that is why I was uh, playing you this uh, clip. Um, I just want to, to find out if anybody uh, could hear the clip. Um, as I tested it this morning, I could hear it from another computer also clear. So I trust that you could uh, also get it clear from, from your side as well. The chaplain that she referred to is the chaplain that introduced it to me. At that stage, he was the regional chaplain of the Western Cape, um, and that was Reverend Gerard Stein. Um, he brought me, uh, Ulrika, to, to my office at Paul's more many, many years ago. I just want to ask you now, it's very difficult for you to shout out here if you are in a group, what do you see here? But for those who can see this and that can respond immediately, what do you see on this picture here? Anybody that want to respond? Can you hear me? Pastor, yes, we can hear you, Southern Cape. I see a picture of a, a gentleman that's facing to me or away from me. Now, now, which one do you think it is, sir? To you or away from you? If I look at the laptop, it's in front of me. If I look at the big screen, he's side, side, facing sideways. Mm. So he's not looking to you. Uh, is one eye is looking to me. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? What do you see? What do you see? An incomplete person, half broken. Okay. And a little bit more specific, um, uh, which direction is he looking at? Sideways or to to you that's facing the screen? Both. Both. Okay, the reality is here that when you look at the picture and when you look at any concept, you will realize that many people look at it from different angles. Mm. So I want us to know from the offset, we are not the experts on uh, victim offender dialogue uh, processes, but uh, we want to share our views, our research on this topic and how we were dealing with it over the last 22 years um, in South Africa and also abroad. So you might see something different than what and how we see it. And we would like to know what is there that you see different in this process of the victim offender dialogue a process that we will deal with today. Because the reality is that this gentleman is looking at you who are looking at the screen. 
if you if you if you study it well but you can also you can also have your own interpretation and convince yourself no he's looking sideways he's not looking to me so let us just <laughs> be open about what we will see on the screen in terms of information now it's being said that this kind of fish if you can have this fish in this little bowl for many, many years, and it will stay like this. And so the question is, where are you? Because we started with the restorative justice and victim offender research in October, 1998, um, during my very first visit to the USA. And uh, Correctional Services launched this program in November, 2001. And so the question is, where are we? But they also say, if you take this fish out of this container and you put it into a bigger space, that is how this fish is growing. So we can, we can stay in that little container or we can move into some bigger space and then we see the growth. But furthermore, they said, if you put that same fish you put it in a river, then this is the result. And, and I can say today that where we are now in 2021, that the restorative justice and victim offender dialogue is now international. So we place uh, the Department of Correctional Services and Hope Prison Ministry and all other stakeholders that's working with us in the international arena. And we're proud of this journey that we can now also share our information internationally. So the objective and the purpose of this restorative justice and victim of in the dialogue process is about restoring. And that is where we want us to focus on the restoration. And we've got the V, the O and the C. And the V is for, for victims. And I just want to mention myself and the former minister was, uh, was speaking at the University of South Africa um, in 2018. And to our surprise, the minister came up with a suggestion that we should move away from the concept of victims and rather call victims of crime offended ones. But unfortunately, that was not accepted. And you know who didn't accept that? We had quite a lot of victims of crime in the seminar. And many of the victims say, no, we, we are victims. They, they wanted to be victims. And so he never came up with that suggestion again or something else. Then there is the offender as well. And we will also focus on, on information about them. And then there is the community. Now, when we are involved in victim offender dialogues or the preparation on victim offender dialogues, this is the three components where the victim is at the center of this process, but we also need to have the offender on board and the community at large. Later on, I will share with you the challenges if, if this three components is not on board completely with a possible victim offender dialogue preparation and even after a victim offender dialogue um, about the parole um, decisions and all that and so on. So we will come back to, to that as well. Okay. So the question is always, what is restorative justice? Now, if you are in the international arena, you hear a lot of interpretations and there are many processes when it comes to restorative justice. I am serving on the uh, Restorative Justice International Board uh, based in California and our president there, um, is solely working on restorative justice for uh, police brutality 
and also for people convicted on um, uh, that was not guilty, they fighting for, for for justice for people like that. So there are many other other people in other areas on this on our restorative justice board. But it's exciting to know that uh, people are really moving forward with a concept of restorative justice. Now this is about an encounter. It's the opportunity to the victims, the offender and the community to meet and discuss the crime and its aftermath. And wow, the aftermath is very challenging during a victim in the dialogue process, the effects of the crime. Um, and that is if they desire to do that, they are coming out with information. But what is important, the encounter and the encounter is not an easy encounter, but that is the opportunity for them to meet and discuss this crime. And then I, I've got this clip, and, and the reason why I, I, I put on this clip, because these are sometimes marginalized victims. This is the daughter of an offender, and this daughter came to this victim offender mediation process and she had the courage to ask her father a straightforward question. And he was prepared to answer her, but I just want to play this clip for you that you can see here's an encounter and here's a question from the daughter because the children of the offenders as secondary victims is always marginalized. And I thought I just want to put this one on. Um, firstly, I would like to say how disappointed I was about everything. Uh, growing up without a father, you were the father figure. So it was hard for me to grow up without a father figure. So I want you to know that the question that I'm going to ask you is not going to change how I feel about you. I have forgiven you, everybody makes mistakes, and God forgives us. You are here for a reason, to, co to correct your mistakes, and we hope and pray that you have learned from your mistakes. You know what we've went through, I have went through, the transcript and everything, but I'm still confused, I don't know the truth, so I'm hoping that today I'm going to walk out of the store knowing the truth. So the question that I want to ask you is, are you guilty? Um, I don't know. I, I don't know what can I say. Uh, I'm guilty because I know the truth. Uh, I didn't tell the truth in the court, but now, since you're asking me, I know the truth and I'm guilty. We've killed that person, but not intentionally. It was a mistake. So uh, I hope that one day the families of the victim, they will forgive me. And I pray every day that I must grow old in my mind, in my soul, that God has a place for me to forgive. And the truth is that I pleaded not guilty in court, but I am guilty. Thank you for that. And I am proud of you. It takes courage, it takes strength for you to stand up and for you to get where you are and say what you just said. Like I said, this changes nothing. We love you, we've supported you. Though I grew up without you, but I grew to be a woman that I am because of the things that you would say to me when I come here. Wow, powerful. The truth will set you free. And that's why it is important to have these. Uh
It's also about restitution. They expect the offenders to take steps to repair the harm they have caused by taking responsibility for the crime, known and unknown. And we will speak about that later on. And their criminal mindset and behavior must also be addressed, including um, gang and underworld related crime. And we hear a lot about this during our restorative justice journey. Therefore, we need to uh, attend to all this information as well. And it's, it's also about inclusion to provide opportunities for parties affected by the crime to participate in its resolution with a multidisciplinary task team. Now, I don't want to compare even management areas, um, the one against the other, but I can say that we are proud here in, uh, uh, within the Department of Correctional Services that we do get a lot of support um, and can work as a multidisciplinary task team. And so it is exciting when we know that the Director of Development and Care and um, Corrections is on board with the process of restorative justice and victim offender dialogues. That is why the um, former president of, of America, Mr. Obama, he made a statement at uh, the memorial service about uh, Nelson Mandela and about inclusion. Furthermore, the inclusion is that we, we have to look at correctional programs, the social workers and the psychologist uh, uh, therapies, the security, therapeutic venues, social auxiliary workers, external stakeholders regarding victim offender or victim identification and tracing. EMC and then the correctional supervision for role boards. These are all people, and 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 I, I I can't I can't think of the challenges if if there is not a multidisciplinary task team for this process because this is a huge task. This is not just to go and knock on the door of victims and get them to the center and have a dialogue. It's more than that. Um, security needs to be in place, everything, therapeutic venues, and we will come back to that later. So all these areas is very important when it comes to inclusion. And then also about the reintegration, because I will show you a statement that the minister recently made. And um, that's why um, preparing the offenders for reintegration, but also preparing the victims of crime for the reintegration of the offenders. Um, to see how the, the wounds of crime can be healed or that there is at least a process where people uh, can meet and discuss the, the crime and the criminal behavior. Um, so it is important that we're looking uh, ahead of time before they release about reintegration as well. The victims of crime versus victims circumstance, victims of circumstances. Now, we picked up this and, and, and I just thought that it's important uh, to mention this because victims of crime is a person or persons who has suffered physically, physical, sexual, financial or emotional harm as a result of the crime. But a victim of circumstances is an individual who suffers ill consequences because of factors that were out of his or her control like maybe in their childhood days. Now, many offenders, when we ask them, who is the victims? Then they will say they are the victims. And then we have to bring them back to the, that you are only a victim of crime if crime was committed against you during your childhood days or any other time, like rape we experienced, Many offenders will tell us how they were raped as children, sexually abused, uh, brutally assault, and then they are victims of crime. But uh, 
um, victims of their circumstances is the challenges of their social economic backgrounds where they come from. So we, we, we had to, to, to address this with them all the time because they're coming into the system, they see themselves as victims, and we do address this. The day she was supposed to appear in the court, I said to myself, I will never go to the court because I will never get my child back. But at the end of the day, because of prayers and talking to other people about it, I even heal myself and see to it that I must come so that Tenji can also be healed. On my personal view, I feel that I'm healed with what she said today. The day she was supposed to appear in the court, I said to myself, I will never go to the court because I will never get my child back. But at the end of the day, because of prayers and talking to other people about it, I even heal myself and see to it that I must come so that Tenji can also be healed. On my personal view, I feel that I'm healed with what she said today. First, I'm very glad to be here in this meeting. And also, I'm very glad to see that they are tangible and personal. That is very good for us. Mm -hmm. And also, I'm very glad to see my sister she is fine now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we had everything. We know the truth. Mm -hmm. We know what's going on. Mm -hmm. Anyway, now we are ha I'm happy. Mm -hmm. That is good for me. And also, the conclusion is peace. Mm -hmm. I will in between play these video clips so that uh, you can just see that there are powerful outcomes. And I know that many management areas even, and any other person involved in victim offender dialogues has also excellent outcomes of the VOD processes. And that is why it is important that we start to record this so that we can share this with the world. Mr. Graham Chadburn. This is how this gentleman looked at the day of his wedding. And I'm using this clip also for us to understand the devastation of the victims' families. And the next picture that I will show you is extremely gruesome. So I, I'm going to do it in a way that I will not uh, harm you emotionally for, for what's going to come on the screen. So I'm going to rather count to three before I put the picture on. Now, this gentleman's daughter is going to share about the murder of her father. And he was murdered by a with a crossbow in his sleep and then his body was thrown in a river here in Cape Town. And three days later, they found this body in the river with an arrow in his head. So I'm going to count to three. If you can't look at gruesome pictures, rather walk away, walk away or turn your face away from your screen. It is very gruesome. But the picture is actually for us to understand and to be sensitive when it comes to victims and victims' families. One, two, three. This is how the body looked when the body came out of the river with an arrow in the head. And so his daughter will share with us um, because we use... Uh, her, Jennifer Chadburn, we use to share this ordeal with offenders. And we had many, many 
positive responses from offenders, even offenders that pleaded not guilty at court, coming to her and saying, we lied at court, we are guilty now that we realize even after 28 years, the memory of your father, the day of his wedding, but also the day that they found him in the river. I want to introduce you to somebody I loved very, very, very dearly. Um, and that is the, the gorgeous man I called my daddy. And we all have a daddy, whether he was good, whether he was bad. Mine wasn't perfect. He was no angel. But I loved him. It was my daddy. It was the guy on whose lap I could sit. And the first man who ever said to me, you are so beautiful. Even though I maybe wasn't. But at that stage, guys, I just loved him so much. And like Jonathan says, he's been um, gone for close to 20 odd years now. And I still love him, love him so much. And I, I just, it's important for your victims to know that you know they were loved. And it's important for you to know that your victims' families will miss them forever. Ever and ever and ever. Every single Father's Day, every single Mother's Day, every single birthday, every single um, Christmas, you name it. The victims' family, they yearn just for one more chance to hear the words, I love you, or Daddy, I love you. Just one more time. For, for lunch, everything was, the tables, the food was cooked, not a great meal. And my granny and grandpa says, but where's Graham? And his wife said, no, he was so upset because him and Jennifer had this massive fight. So he went for a walk. He's not back yet. They're like, sure, that's not him. He missed church. He never misses church. Yeah, but I'm sure he'll be back now. No. And she dished out a nice plate of food for him and they ate. Three o'clock, granny and grandpa said, no, something is wrong. They, it's, it's not him. He will never do this to his parents if he expects them. So um, they call my uncle. He just had his uh, accident. He accidentally cut off his hand. And he was like coming there and says, but where's Graham? And everybody started looking for him. Two days they were looking for him. People phoned me like, Jennifer, what did you say to him? That made him disappear. And I thought, OK. I'm sure he's on his way to me then in, in Joburg because I'm there, so maybe he's coming to make right with me. And I'm like expecting him to walk through the door any minute. Two days later, they found a body in the, in the Lisbeck River. Never ever thought it, it could be him, right? You hear it on the radio, they found this body, whatever, and um, yeah, then they found him with a crossbow in his, in his head. It's like, sure, a crossbow. And they said maybe he was involved with some syndicate or with something, something. I'm like, I don't understand. It just doesn't make sense. In the meantime, his wife still goes to do her hair and she just does everything she usually does. And we're like, where could he go to? I never, ever, ever got the chance to say to him, Daddy, I'm sorry. Never ever. I never got the chance to say to him, forgive me, Daddy, for being disrespectful, for throwing the phone down in your ear. To say I love you. Who of you has got that somebody in your life that you know you need to make right with? Is it your mother? Is it your father? Is it your child? Is it your ex-wife? Is it your girlfriend? 
who is that one person that you go and sleep at night and you don't make right? You might never, ever, ever get that chance again. I want to show you where it happened. He was um, asleep in his, in his bed. Um, and we did have a fight. He went to bed. He went to sleep. And as I say, they found his body floating in the river. About two and a half days later, none of us can understand what happened. What happened? I want to show you something. You saw the picture of my father, the daddy I loved with all my heart. This is what waited for us in that mortuary. Is that my daddy? No. Unfortunately, yes it is. That is what victims need to go and find when somebody killed them and ran away and lied. You don't expect to see that. My uncle had to go in there, look at it like, is it him? Can't be. Somehow, I'm not sure. The fingerprint expert eventually identified him as Victor Graham William Chatburn, my daddy. It's even hard for a man to actually cock that crossbow. So this was my daddy's wife, the one who loved him his friend, his lover, the one who said, yes, I do, until death do us part. Why did she then do it? Why? Now the question starts. When they said it's her, I'm like, no, can't be. Not her. I even phoned her and said, Louisa, I'm so sorry, because I fought with my dad, and look what happened now. She still pretended to be the little widow now that's like, oh, feel sorry for me. In the meantime, she knew when she was speaking to the person who was hurting. Because I didn't say goodbye. You knew that. You knew I didn't get to say goodbye. You used that as your opportunity to have an alibi. How could you do that? Why? Why? The question mark, guys, the question mark is what you are responsible for. Why? Why did she do it? In the end, it, it came out. Money. Money was the reason. Nice insurance policy. This is, this was the very sad situation. The family was shocked when they came to court and they saw the weapon and saw their father's skull on the display there in court because they could not get the arrow out of his head. And so they had to cut off a part of his head and bring that to court and it was devastating for the victim's family to witness that and so um, when offenders come into a system uh, for crime committed um, you can understand why they try to not focus on the brutality of the crime um, but what we need to remember, even during our therapy with them, our spiritual connection with them, we need to know that they committed a crime and we need to help them to address that criminal behavior and the act as well, so that we can also help the victims 
and the community at large as well. The Department of Correctional Services recognized the VOD, VOM as a process under the restorative justice program. So when the, when the, the Department of Correctional Services speaks about restorative justice, victim offender dialogue, victim offender mediation is part of this process. So we can't just say we're doing restorative justice, but we marginalize the victim offender dialogue and victim offender mediation process. It's, it's all one process that we have to work towards. And that is important. The, the Minister of Justice and Correctional Services, the Honorable Ronald Lamola, set on 20 November 2020, which is just last year, the failure to apply restorative justice inadequately continues to portray the department in a negative light. And I can testify to that. I can testify to the times that the minister was summoned almost 20 times a, a, a week for cases against the Department of Correctional Services. And that's why we're looking at the restorative justice process, as I said, including the victim offender dialogue uh, preparation and the process. And I just want to share with you a few challenges that we had, and that is why I'm motivated, especially in South Africa, to go everywhere in our country with my wife, Jenny, that we can help and train people, that we can be sensitive when it comes to the victims of crime. There was the incident of the train accident where 10 children died. And unfortunately, this gentleman got a parole date and then all chaos broke loose where it was immediately in the newspaper. I was contacted by the regional office about this matter and uh, myself and, and Jenny and Neva and Lucia and Luke, we met with the 10 victims, uh, the 10 children's families, and uh, we had a session with them and took them through the whole process. And um, we could understand and we experienced the, the further pain and victimization that they felt that they would not uh, contacted uh, before the parole board made a decision on them. But fortunately, one thing that I experienced with the Department of Correctional Services at different management areas, if they made a make, make a mistake in these areas before it goes to the newspaper, we, 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 uh, we kill the fires. Um, then there is um, three unique cases that I recently worked with and all three men also got parole dates and it was challenging, uh, but their children were affected by this and the family disputed against the decisions and we had to kill fires. And I'm gonna use one video clip of a father who killed his wife and, uh, and the process that we had to follow. And so um, that is uh, challenges and, and, and it's really sad when we have this experience. Um, then there is now another case that is at this point in time, as I'm speaking, at the review board in Pretoria. And that it's also a person that, that got a parole date and the day before his parole date, as it, the day before he has to be released, he was told that uh, he can't go out on parole. Um, his case was referred to the parole uh, review board of the National Council for Correctional Services. It was, it was a tough one. It was a tough one also. Um, then also the Tully Peterson case, recently also after we had uh, already a victim offender dialogue process with one of the victims with the Tyler Peterson family, um, the one offender was unfortunately released and they claimed that they were not contacted. And I know that there is an investigation about that, but it is sad situations. Then the flower gang case, there was five offenders involved in the flower gang came, um, case. But because the flower gang was, because of security scattered in the different management areas, 
And one management area just told uh, their parole board, we're going to work in isolation. We're not going to follow the protocol that you uh, put together. And they released this offender. Or not they released, they made a high, highly recommendation to the National Council. And uh, this person is released and all the others is still incarcerated. Um, and now the victims have now uh, asking the question also, um, about this, so must we now see every offender all the time where we made a recommendation, let the victims see them all together. So there was uh, some kind of victimization there as well. And then Mr. RW, um, he's coming up now in, in one of the video clips that I will explain. And these are the, the challenges that the minister referred to that when the restorative justice uh, um, is applied inadequately, that uh, it really portrays the department in a negative light. And I wanna say to, to correctional services members, I wanna say to stakeholders, Hope Prison Ministry and any other organization on board, um, please, when we get on board with restorative justice, victim offender dialogue, let we remain sensitive and don't have any shortcuts because listening to the people in the cases that I just mentioned here was very, very, very painful. I hope you understand. The victim offender dialogue information and the process. That furthermore, it is important that to know that the offender dialogue is contextualized within several sections of the uh, Correctional Services Act of 1998. In particular, the following section when implementing the victim offender dialogue process. Because section two states that the purpose of the correctional system is to contribute to maintaining and promoting a just, peaceful, and safe society. Okay, I, I, I found it at one stage difficult to, uh, uh, to mute everybody. I'm just scared if I'm going to fiddle here that I'm going to, to uh, lose, uh, I will lose my, 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 my information and I can't afford that. So if everybody can be quiet and keep everybody quiet, if, they, if you're at home and your children is there, it's okay. It's okay, everybody's okay with that because children must be heard in a good way also. It's nice to hear a, a voice of a child, but to promote just and peace and safe society. Later on, I will share, and Mr. Rampasat was with us involved in that case, uh, that I will share how we could help the offender, the victim, and the community in a process of, of, of justice and peace, and now a safe environment in that specific community. Then furthermore, the dialogue also refers to and prescribe, um, and I want to highlight just the uh, assessment of the offender for needs regarding reintegration into the community. And for, for those of who know that when people come into the system, they have to go to an assessment unit. And through that process, there will also be recommendations for uh, a, a need assessment and a risk assessment. There will also be recommendations according to the crime that was committed that the offenders will have a sentence plan. And uh, most of the sentence plans um, recommend to the offender the restorative justice process with the hope of the victim offender dialogue if uh, the victim is prepared to meet with the offender. And then also the department must encourage prisoners to maintain contact with the community and encourage them to stay at rest or in touch or up to date with current affairs. Uh, I think the, 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 the challenge is that they keep themselves up to date with wrong affairs, uh, with gangsterism and all that. So we need to help them and promote 
And uh, we started now a pilot at Gudut Management Area where we engage with all the restorative justice participants, families. We going to families, we contacting families. We want to know what is the real issues at home and where, where there is challenges. We will bring the offender to the center and we have family conferencing. And we had recently also a, a husband that, that claimed that he didn't, he didn't rape a family member's child and uh, admit that and then his wife, um, she wanted to be part of this family conferencing and brought them together and with the multidisciplinary task team of Guru, the social worker, the challenge find that he is. And so we, we now, with this process, um, want the offenders to be aware of the realities of their families, of the victim and the victim's family. I recently went to, um, to Netrech, in, not Netrech, in Eitzig, and I went back to the, to the center and I spoke uh, a week ago uh, to the offender and I said to the offender, sir, I'm sorry to say that what I observe in your street and your victim's family is also in your street and some of them are involved in gangsterism. I am just afraid that they will take revenge on you. And so we bring the reality to them uh, because this is what six and 13 is actually saying, that we must encourage prisoners to maintain to main contact with the community, but because they can't always do it on their own, um, we as an organization, as a stakeholder with the Department of Correctional Services is, uh, is really coming on board and helping them to understand the reality of uh, the affairs outside. Because this is the offender rehabilitation path. And so they need to understand during an orientation process, the security, and then we stand still on uh, personal restoration. And I just want to highlight personal restoration. Under personal restoration is that uh, the offenders need restoration in terms of the offenses that they committed. Because we hear many times that the brutality even of the crime that they committed, they never went through trauma counseling even. The victim's family didn't go through trauma counseling. I had uh, some time back a, a, a chaplain from Switzerland and he couldn't believe that uh, offenders uh, that committed these brutal crimes did not... Uh, uh, go through a trauma counseling session. But in the restorative justice process, we address this. This is part of the personal restoration. The issue of accountability, uh, justice, remorse, and forgiveness. Um, the offenses uh, uh, that, uh, that the suffered, the victims that suffer through the offenses. And we need to address that and identify addictions and behavioral problems. This is just on step three, of the offender rehabilitation path uh, before we even go to development uh, programs and, and, and care programs. And we standing still a lot on this because the reason why we need to engage with the community and we need to engage with the victims of crime. And recently in a VOD, the victim's family stood still for almost 40 minutes to try and find out by the offender. They, they questioned the offender and they almost came to a point and say, how do we know that you are not mentally disturbed? And, uh, and, 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 and it was something new for me again because um, they really wanted, and I can't tell them uh, what uh, the offender uh, went through in terms of the restorative justice or the, 
or other any other therapy programs and i just threw this back to the offender and i said to the offender sir you need to 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 address this now with the victim's family and tell them uh, because of of their concern if you're not mentally disturbed and and i was very impressed with the offender's response he could tell them about his therapy process with a psychologist he could tell them with his process with the social workers with a chaplain of that management area and some spiritual workers as well and uh, and 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 he at that stage he broke down and that was that was quite an experience for me again that we don't have to defend our offenders we need to to train them and not re we, we must not um, rehearse them because that was one of the concerns of the victims also do you rehearse the offenders to come and say what they need to say therefore when we come to the actual training also of the victim offender dialogue process you will find there that uh, how important it is that we're looking at the dialogue not between us as facilitators but a dialogue between the offender and the victims of crime and the victim's family. So this is just what I wanted to highlight. The victim's rights is something that we must always be familiarized with um, because we can't engage with victim offender dialogues if we are not uh, aware of the details of the uh, service charter mm -hmm for victims of crime in South Africa. The Victim Charter is an important instrument for promoting justice at all. And the Victim Charter is also in, in our South African Constitution, Act 108 of 1996. So we've got a mandate, even when it comes to restorative justice, when it comes to victim offender dialogue, we have a mandate. And we are one of the few countries that the entire government is supporting the restorative justice and victim offender dialogue process. Many other countries had to find their way into correctional facilities. It's not completely embraced, but I can say that we are proud to share this with countries that uh, our country is far ahead when it comes to victims' rights now and how we can participate together in this process. Then the rights of the victims, it's uh, also the rights to be treated with fairness and with respect for dignity and privacy. I, uh, the information right, I referred this to the minister's office at some, uh, some stage, that we need to review the victims' rights because um, victims are telling us when they sit in courts um, that there is no respect for them because if the perpetrator is on bail, the perpetrator will come and sit next to them. Very arrogant. And uh, recently it was a rape victim and the officer uh, was on bail and came sit next to the rape victim. There was nobody that, that could help uh, the victim in terms of just uh, her own fears. And so we need to look at that right. The right for information. Uh, I'm writing here, victim's family was shocked when their loved one's skull was in the court for evidence without informing them. It's traumatic. That must be very traumatic. Thank you. For that. Thank you for that remark. That is definitely true. That is definitely true. So we, we found that many, many times information was put together and it's excellent information, excellent theories. But what we are uh, doing over the last 22 years, we making sure that whatever is a theory, we bring it to the practical playground and we see whether it is working or not. And that's what we found here, even with the right uh, to offer information that victims yeah, yes. they were too fearful mm. because of revenge. That's why they didn't come forward with for... the right to receive information. The Department of Connection looks at the scope for Oh, yeah. 
Come again. And then the finger and so. Yes. Jonathan? Yes, sir. Jonathan? Yeah. Jonathan? Sorry to interrupt. Um, when other people talk, it overrides your conversation. Is people having discussions in the background, which is great that they're discussing, but we can't hear you then. So if everyone can just go to the bottom left of their screen, put their cursor there, and you've got the mute and unmute option, and those that aren't muted, can you please mute yourselves because it, because it overrides Jonathan's talking. Thank you very much, Luke. Thank you. Appreciate that. If we Thank can. You, the rights to protection, it's very unrealistic because of the shortage of police. Um, and, and so we need to look at that. And then also the, the right to assistance. There are too little resources in terms of their trauma. Um, most of the victims, and my PA Neva McGregor can tell you that most of the victims that we reach out to never receive any trauma counseling. And uh, we had once a, a young girl that was raped and uh, she had to go for counseling uh, arranged by social services, but she almost had to take two buses to get there and she had no money to go and she just went twice and never again. So these are the areas that we need to look at if we are sensitive to victims as well. And where does the Department of Correctional Services comes in? That is why the doors of correctional services is open for us that we can even share this with the offenders that are so easily forced their way out that they want to know when the CMC is going to review their case. They want to know um, when they go to the parole board and so on. Then also the rights to compensation. There is no compensation. The right to restitution. And we need to understand uh, uh, the expectation of the victims um, because uh, restitution goes with money. There was the, the bomb uh, case in Worcester. And I know of some of the victims, uh, Lucia and Neva is aware of that, that are still trying to fight the government for money that was promised to them and they never received, but there is no money. And that's why offenders were also challenged at certain areas of how can you compensate us? Uh, but I mean, for offenders, they will say very easy, yes, because maybe this is an opportunity for them to get parole easier. So we will, we will share with the offenders not to make these kind of promises because they don't have the money, unless uh, in some way that can be proved, but it, it, was, it never worked before. Um, our president, President Ramaphosa said at the funeral of Winnie Mandela, and this is what I found that even with, with, the, with the violence in our country and more crime being committed, he said that we must also recognize our own wounds as a nation. We must acknowledge that we are a society that is hurting, damaged by our past, numbed by our present and hesitant about our future. This may explain why we are easily prone to anger and violence. And so the question that I'm asking, why must victims of crime and their families become perpetrators of violence and mob justice because of their pain and their anger. And we found how people killed offenders and we did funerals of these offenders already because of they wanted to take um, justice in their own hands and now they are sitting behind bars. That is so sad. Let us be sensitive to victims. If we continue the way we are going, we will pass our woundedness, he said, on, on from our generation to the next, especially manifested in domestic, family, and sexual violence. As the saying goes, hurting people hurts others. And that is why it is important for us to look at the victims of crime, as the center of the criminal justice process, the center of the restorative justice process, and the offenders and the community at last. May I ask a question? Can we 
break for 15 minutes and I will stay online and uh, or for 10 minutes and I will stay online and then we will just make sure that everybody is is back if you need a 10 minute break because it's not everybody that enjoys my voice only my wife enjoys my voice amen <laughs> are you there yes sir we are here thank you we'll take a break okay 10 minute break we're taking a 10 minute break and within exactly now it's 25 past 11 25 to 12 we will be back online 25 to 12 thank you I don't want to take it for granted um, because everybody is now on mute as we requested. Um, it will be very good if we can at least see a thumbs up from your side because technology is so good that if you put the thumbs up, we can all see your thumb is up and that you are, are on board, but we will have to continue. Thank you. Also, if you don't see the picture of uh, Tanya Parkin, uh, Perkins, then Tanya is also on board. Tanya, welcome to you as well. Right, let us, uh, let us continue. I'm going to, to share with you um, some information um, for 15 minutes. Then um, looking at the time and knowing that people want to ask questions, want to make statements, I'm going to open the lines for, for you to ask a question that everybody can listen to the question. Because as I said that this is the beginning of our victim offender dialogue training. We're gonna have also on board, soon we're gonna have victims on board. Um, uh, victims that will come and share with us what was their experiences and how do we all need to be sensitive when it comes to victims of crime. We had uh, 
uh, a few uh, rape victims. We have uh, family members of, uh, um, of murders where husbands killed their wives. And you will see some of, uh, one or two of that clips as well. And um, they will all be on board at our next session where they will share um, and then how we can equip ourselves better when we reach out to victims, when we prepare our offenders for a possible victim offender dialogue, but how we also want to make sure that uh, we're reaching out to victims in a very sensitive manner. So I'm gonna speak for 15 minutes now on information that is needed. And I would like to hear your response. And then after that half an hour, 15 minutes me, 15 minutes you asking questions. After that half an hour, I will go into the, uh, the theory of victim offender dialogue uh, process. Uh, what is the theory behind this? What is the principles? Um, ab about restore a uh, victim offender dialogues. That is where we're going to be. So let us continue. Okay. So the information to be considered before a victim offender dialogue can take place, we experience over many years. Now there was a time that 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 we did up to ninety five victim offender dialogues uh, in one year. And all of that 95 victim offender dialogue processes was highly successful because we believe in the proper process and not shortcuts. Now we all are under pressure for stats and all other challenges, um, but we, we, we still need to be victim sensitive. And I can say to you today, and I say it here with this video recording here as well, that even if you are the president of this country with all respect, or the minister of justice and correctional services, or the national commissioner, if you are not standing with us to be sensitive to victims of crime and pressurize correctional officials for stats, then you are very insensitive. That's my message to them. I, I communicated many times to them. We must be very sensitive. And now that the ministers realize the court cases against them and the embarrassment, I trust that uh, we will together work towards a great process and make sure that we do not take shortcuts. So a proper preparation for both parties is very important. And I'm gonna give you the preparation for the offenders and the preparation for the victims. The offender and the victims is imperative in this VOD, VOM process. My personal conviction is now looking at the mask issue, they say in all places, no mask, no entry concept should be considered. No acceptance of crime, or criminal behavior, no taking responsibility and coming out with the truth, no VOD. We, for 22 years, refused to consider a victim offender dialogue process if we don't know that the offender is now on a rehabilitation process that will take full responsibility for the crime because we can't allow them to sit in front of the victim or the victim's family and still deny the crime. I had a, a, a case where one of our chaplains is aware of where um, the offender for 17 years denies the crime. We had in uh, consultations with him and his social worker. I got the uh, judgment remarks and the sentence remarks from the high court, from the appeal court. I discussed it with him in the presence of his social worker. I pointed out to him on what conditions they found him guilty. And uh, I had a consultation with his family and uh, shared that with his family. I then brought the family to the correctional facility and we had a meeting with the offender and his family and the social workers. And I am very much convinced now that they are at a point where, where it is embarrassing now to, to really speak the truth about this matter, but at least 
um, even their anger that their loved one is not guilty uh, subsided a little bit. So it is important that before we even look at the VOD, we need to have all these things in preparation. And so that's why um, it is important that I'm gonna put up everything here for you now, that uh, we're looking at the principles of restorative justice. And that is very important where we look at that crime damage relationship. So I, I, I know that many, uh, many correctional officials even that reach out to victims, us ourselves, it is not an easy approach to go to victims' houses. You, you, they will even embarrass you in front of other people because what are you coming to do here? You're just coming to open more wounds and uh, they're very upset who gave you our address. And so we, we realize and recognize that crime damage relationships. They don't want anything to do with the, with the offender. And, and, and that's why we need to be aware of, we, we let the offenders focus on the, on the harm caused by the crime. But what is important that I want us to know, the restorative justice basic principles is very, very, very much needed. And then also, because this is a question that comes up a lot, many victims in the communities, especially where there's gang infected areas, they know exactly what's going on behind bars. They know exactly who is in contact with the community. So one of the areas that we test the offenders is a sign of remorse is to break ties with negative friends outside and break ties with negative friends inside. Because this question comes up all the time in victim offender dialogues when, when crime was committed in the communities, especially when it was gang related. They want to know uh, if they're still involved in crime and in gangs and all that and so on. So it is important that we, we get to know this information as well. And then also uh, looking at the, the, the pillars of restorative justice and the victim offender dialogue mediation. Um, when I started to use the scale as the, the Greek philosophy bring out the scale as a, a just a restoring a balance. I, I brought some information to the scale and I looked at that, that the victims is on the one side of the scale for support and empowerment. And we found that if victims that did not experience support and were not empowered, we experience still bitter and angry victims. That's why we do not get the, the cooperation from victims easy. So that's why we can't just reach out to the victims and expect them to be at the center the next week or the next month. We need to give them some time. That is why it is important to know that even if victims is not ready to come, that we do not ask them for a victim statement because they might not even be ready for a victim statement. We need to make sure that these people got some support and the people that need to support them is the police services because there is a a center at each center, social services, but social services is overcrowded with, with work and, 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 and they do not have all the resource, resources. The National Prosecuting Authorities, the Department of Health, Justice and Correctional Services, community leaders, the community at large, and even the victim advocacy. And recently, we, we, we had a, 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 a person whose daughter was murdered about 20 years ago. And when we reach out to the victim's family, the victim's family went to their social a psychologist and the psychologist recommend um, that they should not go for the victim offender dialogue process and also requested us to stay away from the family. So this is the things that we experience. And so um, if we are not gonna be careful, it is the Minister of Justice and Correctional Services that will be taken to court. And that's why he is saying now, um, if we don't run this process um, in, a, in a respectful, honorable way, 
then there's going to be challenges. So victim support and victim empowerment is extremely important. And on the other side is the offender. And the scale will be balanced if the offender takes responsibility um, and, and as I will refer to the restorative justice path as well. But look at the difference. Look at, at what is uh, uh, available for the offender. There is the assessment unit. There is the offender rehabilitation path. There is actually a vision, a mission that correctional services had for every offender. If you look at the offender rehabilitation path, there is a sentence plan. The offender can know exactly what needs to happen. We recently started to request that the police report be available much sooner because the police comes to the parole board and then give a report of Johnny that is so evil, but Johnny is in prison for 18 years already. So if we knew about Johnny's lifestyle, according to the police report, when Johnny comes to prison, then we can work with Johnny about his criminal behavior. And so I challenge, I challenge the police on this on one of the parole hearings as well. The case officer is there, the restorative justice victim of in the dialogue facilitators is there, DCS and stakeholders, the chaplaincy is there, psychologists, psychiatrist, criminologist is there, although there is only one criminologist in the Western Cape. Social workers is there, the CMC, the parole board, the offender's family, the community leaders, and even we call on unrelated victims of crime like Jennifer Chadburn and Didi and Melissa um, that comes on board to share their ordeal. So this is what we actually mean by justice where we say this is a justice that, that heals. It's a justice that heals. This is how the justice scale should be. And this is what we are proud of, that we have this thorough process. And this process recently was accepted in a presentation um, in Lithuania, uh, the border of, 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 of Russia. And the national chaplain said, I love this program because it's well balanced. And so we need to look at this and then um, just I'm going to put up everything here for you. This is a, 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 a lot of information, but I broke it up in pieces, so you don't have to worry now. I'm not going to go through it now, but this is the restorative justice journey from the orientation in yellow to the blue, where we look at uh, the background of the offender. There is denial. We're looking at the ripple effect of crime. We're looking at solutions taking responsibility, we're looking at accountability, examine the roots uh, and confessions, repentance, we're looking at forgiveness. And, and, and Jenny and Luke and, and their team work with a group of female offenders for 150 hours. And in that 150 hours, it was evident that the offenders was excited about God's forgiveness they were excited about the forgiveness of their family. They were excited about victims that will forgive them. But the problem was they were not ready to forgive people. That was quite an experience because their pain was so deep and they, they could not make the connection. But if we hurt people so brutally also, and we want them to forgive us. We can't forgive those who hurt us. So we had to deal with that. We're dealing with restitution, with reconciliation. And um, the, the latest restorative justice process, and we started now at uh, Gurut and at uh, Marmersbury, where it's now 100 hours per group of everything that we are doing now in this whole process of restorative justice, including uh, family conferencing and victim offender dialogue processes. So that is all on board. And then lastly, we're coming to the victims of crime, the ripple effect. And then we're gonna ask you to respond before we going into the theory of a victim offender dialogue, what it's all about, how should we do it? What should we know about that? Um, we're gonna do that after 
people ask questions or make remarks. So here is the ripple effect of crime. And what is important that we also need to know that there is a ripple effect. Give you an example. If someone was murdered in the family, we can't just go to one family member and work towards a possible victim offender dialogue process if the victim's family was not all aware of the process. So what we normally do, we will go to a house, we will find out how many family members is there. It's mom and dad and, and three or four other siblings. So we will tell the contact person, can you get the family together and share what we shared with you today? What we also can do, what we also recommend to them is that get the family together and then we will come and explain to the family. And in a very upmarket community on the coast of, uh, of Sea Point and, 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 uh, and uh, Bentry Bay, I, I found myself in a house and I went through this process with a victim of crime. And when I was uh, busy with the third victim, this gentleman stopped me and he said, sir, you need to just give me some time. I need to call my wife. She must see this. She must see this. This will also help her. And it was amazing how, how they reacted to, to this presentation. So we need to know that, that crime has a ripple effect. And sometimes the victim's family forgive the offender, but the offender get victimized in the community and even victimized by their own family as well. So what is important to understand, what do victims experience? And if we are victims of crime, and many of us are victims of crime, then uh, we will know what victims experience. And, and when we reach out to victims, we need to be aware of what they experience. And that will also help us to understand how they will react when we knock on their door. They experience extreme trauma. They never forget what happened. Uh, disempowerment. The victims won't trust easily. They will be too suspicious. And even, I will say, in this context, poor correctional officials that's going to knock on the doors of victims with, with uniforms on, they get victimized too because they are so suspicious. Are you here on behalf of the offender that needs parole? The loss of control of feelings and memories, the loss of safety, dis disrespected, and their feelings. What do they feel? Helplessness, they feel violated, the horror, the fear, the shock, the human dignity violated, humili humiliated, frustrated, angry, bitter, and destruction they experience, and also sadness. And they are very upset. What do they want? And this is what we can give the victims. When victims see this slide, oh, so you recognize there is things that we want. Yes. So we want you to consider to be part of the victim offender dialogue process because you might get what you want. And what victims want is they want to be empowered again. They don't want to fear when they walk in the streets and Johnny is out that they will be attacked again. They want truthful answers. There are many victims that just heard about the crime. They were not at the crime scene. They were not there when the crime started. They just heard about it. The loved one lost their life or the loved one was raped. They don't know what happened. They want truthful answers and the offender has the answers. But as I showed you, that there is a process of almost a hundred hours to bring offenders to that reality. And you did offenders that even after 10, 13, 15 years that are still uh, not ready to give the truth to the victims for some reason. Um, I, I remember at the NCCS sitting in February last year, we were dealing with a guy for 24 years 
he still claimed he is innocent. And, uh, and he was then for psychotherapy more than once and, and still claim. And when he started to realize that the only way out is now to say I'm guilty, that I can get parole. But when he did that, there was another investigation was just this to get parole or is it genuine? So all these kind of things. So if they come out with the truth, it must be truthful. Then victims want to offer uh, the offender to take responsibility. Responsibility for many things. And time doesn't allow us to go into that. We're dealing with that on the restorative justice process. Taking responsibility also for, as we call it, your blind spots. If you know that you had challenges, like, like they say, like a peeping Tom. A, a peeping Tom is somebody that grew up watching people through windows and through key, key holes, and they grow up with A peeping Tom is people that grew up in homes where they could hear people having sex with one another, and they grow up with that sound, and they are fascinated by that sound, and now, innocent people get raped and sexually abused. They need to take responsibility for their blind spots. If you are a person that, that can't control your anger and, and you're a short fuse, you need to take responsibility for that also to get help. So there's many areas that we cover in that. Then victims want to tell their own story. There is nothing better when a victim sit over, uh, on the opposite side of an offender and tell their own story about the ripple effect of the crime. Victims want restitution. How can you give back? And what we found internationally with no money, what victims can give back is when victims experience the remorse of the offender. Now, now, this is a, a true story of a female police officer that unfortunately shot her lover, uh, other lover dead, and she landed up in prison. And her mother, uh, the mother of the deceased, came in for the VOD. And the mother said three times to the offender, I will never forgive you. Then the offender's response was very remorseful response was, ma'am. If you look at my file, I'm not here today for you to forgive me. I wanted to come and listen to your pain so that I can realize the damage that I caused. After that lady said three times, I will never forgive you. Her final remarks is, I'm going to ask God to help me to forgive you because she experienced this offender's remorse. We don't have to convince victims and the community that offenders have remorse they can come and experience it that heartbrokenness for that wrong turning away and for years now we have many video clips where we challenge the gangsters you can even be a general if you are really remorseful you will go to class and drive and you will tell them i'm out of the number even if they kill you and i'm bold enough to say for 22 years i will bury you thursday but by God's grace, for 22 years, nobody died when they made this decision. But victims want to experience that remorse. Then what victims anger is also that some victims want to take revenge and some victims will never forgive. We can't be naive and thinking that all the victims will forgive. Some are not ready to forgive. But we will see in the theory of the victim of in the dialogue process, we will see it is not just about forgiveness, it's about the dialogue. It's about the opportunity for them to sit and listen to one another. So these are very important factors that we need to know. How prepared is the offender and how prepared is the victims of crime before we really consider the victim offender dialogue process. And yeah, I know that you are pressurized with stats and I know that you are pressurized with all areas of, of running this process. Um, but if we can do it with all dignity and respect to our victims in our community, then we're gonna have more breaking ground. And I trust here yeah, that uh, we, we, I worked out a possible way forward for us 
as, as, as a region in the Western Cape. And we have people from outside the region as well that we can look at how can we work together um, because there was recently, again, like before, and I say this with all respect, many discussions about the way forward, the way forward. There was documents written about the way forward, and then everything is just stuck. And unfortunately, 22 years later, whole prison ministry uh, is now showing this is where we are. But that is also because we were passionate about this because we started this process right in 1998 already with our research. So I'm going to allow people to open their lines. If, 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 if the person that want to say something or ask something can do that and then just mute yourself again, um, you can do so that it will be good if we can take time just to listen to one another's questions and then I will to the best of my ability answer if there's a question and we're still going to touch base with the information then I will just tell you that we're coming there okay can I hear anybody can you just tell us who you are and then uh, and then uh, we will listen to you. Anybody, you can just put yourself off mute and then we listen to you. There will be a cut of time that I will continue. It sounds to me, it's almost like I'm taking it for granted and assume that you want to listen to my voice if you don't have questions or remarks. The person that want to speak and put the, uh, yourself on, on, on uh, off mute. Hi, Jonathan. This is Doug at Franschelgrave. I just wanted to know if you're planning to do an RJ training shortly, because last year's one was cancelled due to COVID. You got another one planned at all? We, depending on, um, I mean, we, we uh, uh, it, it, it is always better to have a small group training for RJ um, personally, um, other than uh, the, this process, but this is better than nothing. Um, we, we want to do another training because we're starting now a restorative justice process at Gurut and Malmesbury soon. So we, we will definitely look at that. So if you can stay in contact with uh, Andrew's PA, with Inga, then um, uh, she will inform you when we have another RJ training. And the training is normally over three days, minimum. For six hours a day, which is 18 hours. Okay, thanks, uh, Jonathan. Just keep in mind, you want a small group? I've got three people who are interested right here, close to us. You can just forward Sorry. that to the office and they will inform me about it. Perfect. Thank you very much, man. And thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Especially when it comes to the uh, uh, how, what we need to take in consideration before a victim offender dialogue process. Are you in agreement or should we just make sure that the offender did a restorative justice orientation program and... Uh, the offender is ready for, for this emotionally, psychologically, even spiritually, and arrange the VOD. Or what do you say about, about the, um, the restorative justice path and uh, also the, um, the information about the victim? And I want to say that it can be very overwhelming for correctional officials to think, but we don't have the time to do all these long hours. That is why we are there as stakeholders to come on board with you. You don't have to do it alone. We are, we are working as a multidisciplinary task team. So um, let us do it together. So just want to know, what do you say about the information before we even consider a victim of in the dialogue process? Pastor, it's uh, Mr. Rampasad, Southern Cape. Um, yeah. I just want to make some comments. 
Um, like you were saying, the, the entire process, um, it needs to, be, needs to be practiced for what it was intended um, and not for the stats. And if we take that as our starting off point, I think we will, we will be able to do much. Um, and I think empowering ourselves is also key and the training is very essential. Um, currently, you know the prison setup, you know um, with our members, it's security members that's being given now to do the VOD and, and to do all of the, the legwork. Um, okay, we have the professionals that's involved, we have the auxiliary social workers, um, but it's not enough. And I think um, your information that you've shared today or the training rather um, that was done by you and your team, it's, it's very clear that we need, we need, um, I would say to say, the way you've put it through to say, we need to, before we, before we approach the victim, we need to approach ourselves. We need to be clear as to what is it that we want to, uh, to get, or what is it that we intend doing uh, before we get to them. And I think it's, uh, our team is very grateful that you've shared this information with us and invited us to the session. Um, we have a long history and, and, and I'm sure we will do this, do this again. So I wanna thank you on behalf of my team as well. Thank you. Uh, we have another question. Yes, you okay, you can talk, sir. No, no, I, it was there a question from your side and one of your members? Yes. Let me listen. Yes. Thank you, uh, Reverend. Like you said, we are in a group, so they post the questions to us and we forward it to you. Okay. okay. But, uh, they want to know that in your presentation previously, you said that you, we cannot force the victims to participate in the VOD. Mm -hmm. uh, but what, what, what will happen in the writing of the report to the CSPB and the CMC? Yeah, I can, I can share with you from the National Council of Correctional Services um, perspective. And, and we, we were dealing with, uh, with lifers and we were dealing with a deep sense of brutality in the crimes. And one of our requirements is a, a, a victim offender dialogue process or a possible victim or dialogue process and the restorative justice process. But what is very important, and, and the former minister made it very clear in one of his statements also, that, that we can't force victims to come for a VOD, but your, your victim statement must be very clear. You can't just write a victim statement and saying, we were at this address and the number of, this is the street, this is the address, and the people said, this people is not staying there. That is not enough. You have to investigate more because there might be somebody in that street that knows where the victims move to, or then you can ask one or two uh, um, neighbors and ask them, say, why are you there? And do you mind if we can just, do you can confirm that we were speaking to you, that we can have your details. And in one case we had, uh, a, a policeman that was shot during a crime uh, a scene and he was shot dead and we said that uh, it was a pity that the specific center didn't uh, make contact with the human resource department of the police because there is somebody that received that person's pension you see so what the minister is in, uh, uh, interested in and what now the local parole boards is interested, how much effort was made to reach out to the victims and what is the kind of information that you can prove that either the victims is not interested and they is not, you can, you can ask them, can you tell us why you're not interested? And every information then comes onto the report and that will be accepted. An offender can't be uh, um, not discriminated against him, but it can't be denied a way forward if the offender went through all rehabilitation processes and there is proof of the offender's transformation and that, that, that the offender will now be uh, disqualified because of the victims that can't be traced. The, the, the victim's statement must be very clear. 
all the dates when you were there the people everything yeah the phone calls and the visits i recently went to a home um reverend francis online here she was aware of that i went to this community and um, then they told me that the main uh, representative of the family is working i phoned uh, his boss and i explained to his boss about uh, about my contact to, to, to one of his employers. And the boss said, you're welcome to come and use my boardroom. And I sat with the family member in the boardroom of this company and had a very decent conversation. And it's now that the victim's family is saying, um, we, 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 we don't want to be part of the victim offender dialogue. And I forward that information to um, Reverend France as well. So your, 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 your victim statement must have a lot of details. Thank you very much, Reverend. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, Jonathan, this is Didi. Um, so I, can I, I just- Can I get your surname, please? Baker. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I was just listening to the conversation now with regards to being in touch with the victims. And <clears throat> I was just wondering if you could like explain a little bit more what the perspective is in terms of offenders being in touch with victims. Because I know that there are times, like you've said, when the offenders are, are not, um, Taking, taking responsibility for their crime, and it can be re-victimizing for the victim. But there are other times where the victim says, why are you getting in touch with me now? So many years have passed and nobody even tried to talk to me. Um, so what do you say about offenders trying to get in touch with victims? Should it be encouraged? Should it be discouraged? Um, and also like, even before the restorative justice process, like what's what's your opinion on that? There is there is different there is different experiences, Didi. Um, the one is that uh, recently in in a VOD at Malmesbury, the um, the family asked the son-in-law uh, who killed um, their sibling, his wife, um, why didn't you make contact with us? And, and his response was, because I needed to respect you people. I needed to respect you. And they accepted that. Another, another question was asked, why didn't you not make contact with us? Why now? And the offender said that I wanted to make contact with you, but I was discouraged to make contact with you. Why were you discouraged to make contact with us? It's because of the sensitivity. And the offender also said, and because I was not ready. And when the offender said that, I connected that to something recently that your dear loving husband sitting next to you, Didi, um, is now on board with myself and Neva about an offender, a sexual offender, that are writing letters left, right, and center to his victims, trying to explain his behavior and, 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 and actually re-victimize that victims and the victim's family as well. So um, we, we discourage offenders to make contact with victims, even via a letter, but we also encourage them, especially when there is a sense of a connection between them and the victim and the victim's family in, in certain areas. It might be a family member that was that's staying in the house where the crime was committed. It was a family member somewhere else, or it was a member in the community where they know, uh, because sometimes they will use their families to reach out to these people, almost asking them, when are you going to come for a VOD? Because it's only the VOD that keeps me behind bars, which is not true. But so, so we are saying to offenders, if you want to write to victims, write the letter and get it on your file. So if that question comes up, 
then you can say that there is a letter on my file, but because of the sensitivity that I didn't send the letter to you, but you can read the letter that I wrote three years ago, I was already like, for instance, remorseful for what I did and, uh, and, and the damage that I caused you. So we're gonna deal with this case now of this offender that's writing letters to, to the victim's family because there is no control uh, of his letters because when the security look at the letter, they just see he's writing a letter to his victims. This is great. There's no security challenge there. So, but we're gonna follow up on that. So um, they can write, but we also had, Neva can tell you, we had where we were reading the letter and forwarded to the authorities, and then we make a decision together. So we must deal with it in a very sensitive way. Anybody else? Um, Jonathan, it's it's me again, Didi. So I have another question, a different question. Didi Baker. Um, I was wondering, so like a, a lot of the information that you gave us today really highlights how how sensitive of a process this is. And and I was wondering like what what's the next steps in terms of practically equipping us who's like attending this training? to be able to also like eventually facilitate such processes because also what I'm hearing um, as well is that there's such a shortage there's like such a huge demand of of people who want to go forward with victim offender dialogue so what's the next step so that we can be equipped thank you very much Mrs. Baker for that question we're gonna give you an answer in a little while it is on this it's gonna come on the screen as a way forward Do you want an answer now or will you wait? No, I, I can wait. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good at waiting. <laughs> that is how I know you. Anybody else? Can we move on? Uh, yes, Pastor. One more question, Southern Cape. Sure, sure. Reverend, uh, just for interesting sake, uh, a question. Offender is, is sentenced to 12 years. Né? He's already 10 years in his sentence. And the offender is still in denial. He's got two more years to go. Then he will go out on SED. The VOD was, was held, but the victim is still traumatized. What, what, what can you suggest the way forward if this offender go out on SED? Because we don't have any responsibility now towards the, the offender but still the victim was in one of our processes. What will you suggest the way forward? Yeah, uh, did, he, did he do a, 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 a restorative justice process? Uh, that's, that's some question that comes to my mind. I'm also, I'm also aware of the uh, human resources that side for a complete restorative justice process. And we can talk about that for the near future. But in terms of your question, um, I, I, I don't want to assume that it is a sexual offense case. It, it is. Yeah, uh, th this, is the, this is the one unfortunate thing, sir, that we found um, when it comes to even uh, sexual offense cases where the offender uh, still is vile, <laughs> and I can understand why the victim still is traumatized because she knows exactly what happened to her and here's the man that is in denial. So what we did at Gudut, and maybe we can follow up on this, what we did at Gudut, um, we had two strong, extremely strong victims of crime, of rape, that came into Gudut in our restorative process and they shared with the offenders, I, I think there was, it was almost 80% of, of that group of 24 were sexual offenders. And they all, when we did the orientation, they all already told us they're not guilty. And that day when this two rape victims came in and share their painful experience, 11 sexual offenders came to stand in front of them 
admit that they're guilty because they said that we never knew that you can experience all the things for many years and we are in denial. So we put ourselves now in the shoes of our victims as we listen to you. So that is one of the breakthrough areas. And, 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 and the, we, we have a process in place that is more based on our experience than a theory in terms of how to deal with uh, sexual offenders in denial. So maybe we can offline, we can speak about this and see wh what we can do. But on the other hand, also, we need to engage with a, with a victim uh, if the victim is contactable. And uh, it will be a good case study, sir, because what is important for us, and I will make time for this, when it comes to issues like this, it's going to be helpful for many others who comes on training that we can use this as examples without using names. So that will be important for us to talk about that offline, sir. Are you still there? George, are, uh, you, still yes, there? are you Yes, yes. Sorry, we unmuted. Okay. Um, Mr. Rampasad uh, and, um, um, and also the team yeah. there, we can talk about this and yeah, we can look at something for uh, ahead of time. Yes, sir. We, we, I, I did hear you. Um, I've, I've made notes of it. We will, we, will, we will send you the information and then we can talk, talk more sure. about it. Sure. Um, sure. Just one more question with your experience. In terms of uh, victim tracing, how would you say is the best way to approach it? Or which personnel or which person should be the ideal person to approach the victim tracing? Well, then I, I know that there, there, there is uh, the responsibility at one stage uh, was uh, uh, as the head of a center who is the chairperson of the uh, victim team or to, to make sure who's going to do that. But I know also at certain management areas, the CMC will, will try to get a, 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 um, the um, sentence remarks and the judgment remarks. And even there is sentence and judgment remarks, even for people that do not have a serve a life sentence. But where you start, you, 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 you must have obviously the case, the case number and uh, you can start by the police who arrested this person. Um, there is times that unfortunately, and, and the minister um, of police referred to this as in this presentation as well, um, that unfortunately the police doesn't uh, do justice to the investigation. Even when it comes to the SAP 62, they will just say there by, by victim, a colored man or a white man or a black lady. And, and, and there's not even details in there. But there is also the, the register of the court that also should have uh, information. Now, the best way to deal with this matter is, is not a telephonic conversation because you won't have enough proof for that. It is you do this via emails because when you forward that emails and attach it to the offender's profile for the local parole board or if it's a lifer to the NCCS that, that, that the local parole board or the NCCS will then be able to see that the efforts being made to trace the victim. And then obviously also um, if there was witnesses and the witnesses mentioned um, in the court reports, um, you can try and trace that. So, so all that tracing or the effort of the tracing just need to be recorded. But again, um, straightforward, um, CMC can get a, a, a information from the police, from the court, and, 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 and also sometimes like ShopRite was robbed and it would happen that specific time. Is there still people working at ShopRite at the time of the robbery? 
Do you know of Johnny that was shot dead? Do you know anything about Johnny's family? So every little detail that you read up in terms of the crime is very important that might help to trace the victim or the victim's family. Thank you, Pastor. Um, I, we've heard your information. We've, uh, we, we receive it and uh, we will take it further. The, the, the one thing that I want to say is, um, which you, you didn't touch a lot on, is the actual person that's doing the victim tracing. The other processes, are, yes, I'm familiar with it. The reason why I'm asking is because you find, like you said, in some places the CMC will do it. In some places the auxiliary social worker will do it. Um, and and a, lot of, a lot of times a person working at the CMC is just another security member that's been put there. He doesn't have that, that special training or that yeah. professional training in terms of handling the victim or, 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 or the manner in which to approach them. And uh, like you said, sometimes it might just be a phone call. And you open, to you, it's just, a, uh, um, you know, you're phoning someone, but to the person on the other end, you're opening up um, entire uh, wound that was now changed their entire life. So, so I think um, uh, uh, in, that, in that, that context, that's why I'm asking the question. Um, and also, we can also maybe look at um, on your other trainings. Uh, I'm not giving you more work, but that's something that we can look at is in the terms of the victim uh, uh, tracing. Um, you know, maybe a, a uh, some pro forma, pro forma document that we can use uh, in terms of this victims. Um, this is what are the questions we should ask. Um, you know, something like that, that uh, so that when when the person or a correctional official uh, is, is trying to handle this task. We do it with professionalism. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, thank, thank you, you sir. We can definitely talk about that again, but uh, just uh, one of the documentations of the Department of Correctional Services in terms of the role of different stoke stakeholders in the victim involvement in restorative justice programs and parole participation, um, there is a there, there, is, there was a recommendation that external stakeholders and auxiliary social workers can be used for that purpose. Okay. Um, I'm coming back to that now. The CMC to provide information and guidelines to the forum regarding offenders and victims, identify possible victim offender dialogue um, candidates, and then collect reports um, uh, in terms of the victim offender dialogue, face-to-face -face dialogue, and then the correctional um, process. Now, as I say, with all respect, there, there is a lot of people a lot of documentation, unfortunately, of DCS on paper since many, many years ago, even since 1994, um, that was never properly implemented. Uh, and, and I can understand why, sir, and I've got sympathy with that because of the shortage of staff and, uh, and, 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 and um, lots of vacancies that's open and so on. But coming back, even now, with the, I'm constantly asking the auxiliary social workers if their contract is renewed yet, and I get constantly uh, answers, not yet, not yet. And so there's a part that's standing still. But on the other hand, sir, there is two things. Um, one of this is not really for this, for this uh, uh, VOD, but I can mention it because it jeopardized the process of rehabilitation. Correctional services should have never accepted the waiting trials under their responsibility. The second thing is this, that correctional services also should have never accepted the victim offender uh, process under their responsibility. When you, when you apply for funding, we tried it once and never again, but when you apply for funding um, to correctional services even, for restorative justice funding, um, they, were re they referred us to social services. When we replied to social services, they referred us back to correctional services. Like Mrs. Cook Kong at the head office will always say, there is unfortunately so many gray areas in the department. And this is one of the gray areas, sir, that, that, it, is very, that it is not exactly uh, policy who is legally responsible for the victims of crime. 
There is a policy on restorative justice, yes, that um, the process of restorative justice, but um, they, they, they had many meetings already. Um, people like Pastor Jerome Samuels, they will tell you documents that they wrote about uh, a process. And um, there is just a, a stagnation because of, of, of a workload, uh, overcrowding, shortage of staff. And that is what we want to encourage you also as a management area and other management areas, make use of your stakeholders. Let us take hands. We are legally part of the Department of Correctional Services with a legal document in our service delivery with the operational agreement. Um, we need to adhere to all policies of DCS. So make use of, of our service providers so that we can, we can come alongside each other um, part of what Didi was asked, I will, I, will, I will just mention that I'm going to speak also as a way forward about uh, how uh, we already reach out to victims, how we try to trace victims. And recently, uh, Luke Baker was with me when we went to, to look for, for a, victim, uh, a victim's family. And the neighbor could tell us about the murder as if it happened the previous night. And she gave us so much detail. And so it was very helpful. Um, in actual fact, the, 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 the daughter of the victim was very, very upset. Even with DCS, she wrote hundreds of emails to DCS. But since we engaged with her, since we were there at the community, I never heard from her again, so we could diffuse the situation. So we're definitely going to look at how best we can reach out uh, to trace victims, support victims, empower victims. Sir. Thank you, Pastor. Pastor, uh, just to uh, give you some insight on our management area in terms of our social workers or our auxiliary social workers. We have three, and and I think only uh, we only have one currently. Yeah? Uh, the contracts were not. Um, yeah. renew. Now, if you look at it, we have nine correctional centers and 10 community corrections officers. So, so the resources are a little bit uh, overstretched. Uh, also, with that being said, my conversation with you the, pre the other day, in, uh, my WhatsApp, if you look at uh, the way the department's going in terms of, um, I just want to talk about the RDs, you mentioned the RDs, they are asking us to now do the CRAs, um, the assessment for the, for the RDs, yeah. Um, you're having case files for them and so forth, so forth. So basically, it's the same principle that we are doing with the sentence offenders, continue to see them and have the case files with the assessments. And uh, like you said, all of these policies are in place or, or the documentation are in place, but the actual uh, putting it down or doing it, um, that's not being fully implemented. And yep. uh, I'm just sharing this with you. It's, uh, it's, I know you won't be able to assist now, but obviously on your talks on other levels, uh, it's just insight for you to bring bring out as well. Um, is that we're now focusing on the on the on the RDs. We're going to start with that process. Whereas with the sentence offenders, the the VODs, which is a a, a big thing, um, because it's on our performances as well. Um, we we still not uh, producing or we're not making our targets. So apart from all of that, like I said from the beginning, the very onset or the 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 reason for the VOD and the VOM. Um, we're not going to achieve it for the reason is because of the shortage, but but we are trying. Yeah, we are trying. I'm not all negative, but I just want to give yeah. you that perspective as well. No, thank you very much for that, sir. It really gives me more insight because uh, coming back to the uh, remand detainees as well, um, you're aware of the remand detainee policy that came out uh, a, a few years ago, not not too too long ago, and 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 the, there is not even time to to properly implement that policy. So it, it, it can be very frustrating for, I call it grassroots level correctional officials that are actually there where things happening and the frustrations that people in the sections and in the sentence experience and they just get pressure from, from, from head office, from people that sitting and putting programs together um, that things must be challenged, sir. It must be challenged because you must remember 
correctional services is not prison services anymore that they could just do what they want to do. Correctional services have policies in place. There's a correctional services act. There is our constitution and people can be challenged. And if it's stakeholders that will challenge them, so let it be. Because the challenge is not gonna be disrespectful. The challenge is just gonna be that we bring so much more damage. And in the topic of victim offender dialogue, that if you're not gonna spend time with the CRAs, with the remand detainees, when are you gonna have time to, to work on even the restorative justice process and the victim offender dialogue process? So these are things that need to be challenged. And as I always say, sir, and I say this with respect, that people come and go. I have people over the last 30 years that with a passion made changes to certain things in correctional services. They gone. You don't, they don't even want to hear the word prison. They gone, but they made decisions for people that's now in the system. And up till recently, I even challenged the National Commissioner with this 19, uh, 2068 vision that you need to have shorter visions because you can't make a decision for people in, 19, in 2068 and you're gonna be out within two, three years, even in two, three months. So we need to be firm. We need to know what we're standing for. And if, and if we as stakeholders become the voice for people like the community, like the victims, so we need to be that, sir, because this is a very serious operation, the Department of Correctional Services, because we don't just lock up the prisoners and throw the key away. We're dealing with people. We're dealing with victims, the community, and the offenders family. And if we're going to shortcut this process, we damage people. And we need to talk about this, but we need not to talk about it to condemn what is the solutions. And, and with our training, we have solutions and management areas that accepted the solutions we're running, sir. So let us talk about this also offline and, and uh, our teams is ready to get on board. Uh, we've got a traveling team as well, so let us talk. Let us talk. You can send the, the money tomorrow already. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Pastor. That's how I know you to challenge them. That's why we're giving you the information. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Can we, um, let me just see, it's now 20 to 1. We've got 20 more minutes. Um, I'm just going to go through um, the theory of victim offender dialogue and uh, mediation process. And then I'm going to answer Didi's question as the way forward. And then we're gonna look at um, um, your responses and you can even respond to us via email if you want us to have ongoing training um, on this area and then also ongoing training for the actual restorative justice uh, process. And we are also happy to come and do a, a restorative justice process where officers can sit in and observe the full process. And I can tell you that officers that sat in, they, they don't want to leave the process when we're back there again. So that is what we can do. Yeah. And you can send the, the email to Inga. Um, Inga was in contact with all of you. So you can just send her your responses and we will have a meeting and we will follow up on that. And your email addresses can you also send to, to, to Inga. Okay, thank you very much. Can we move on? Going once, going twice, let's move on. Now, this picture there, before we come into this, um, um, this was one of uh, another area that um, uh, I, I think that we, 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 we I, I don't think it was a challenge to correctional services, but um, it is, it's amazing when you give correctional service a thorough report of something that, that how they considered to approve it. Now, the gentleman here in the green, he, 
when he was standing there at Paul's Mall, he was still an offender that came from another management area. Now, this gentleman also, this gentleman told the officer in his section that he killed his wife and he gave all the reasons why. And uh, they contacted me and myself and my PA that's standing here with a pink or cerise or whatever color it is, a beautiful color. Uh, the two of us went to this family. <clears throat> When we got there, we heard the mother who is here, the mother was already 80 years old. She told us how this gentleman, her son-in-law, killed a daughter in front of this boy who was eight years old at the time. The daughter was five years old, and this is the sister of the victim. And when we listened to their story, I actually told my PA, please don't make contact with this family anymore because this was very painful for them to tell us this ordeal. It was very sad to hear that um, the side of the offender and now we have the side of the victim. And we said, let them come back to us. They came back to us almost a year and a half later and they told my PA, you failed us. Why? because he is at Paul Small Medium C. He will be released today. That was that time. And I made contact with the center. They confirm it. I made contact with that specific management area with the parole board. I asked the parole board a few questions and I said to them, I don't have authority to make a decision above your decision, but I can make a recommendation to you. The best is that you reverse this parole decision of yours immediately. And they understood it and they reversed the parole decision. They called the person back to the, to the center. And um, then we engaged with the family. And I think months after that, his five brother-in-laws came for the VOD. And then to our surprise, the rest of the family came. And I just want to show you the video clip, three short video clips of the response after the first VOD was three hours and the second VOD with them was um, just over two hours. This is, this is for me a God picture. Yes, we will always be dumbstruck when we see God is doing miracles. And so once again, we want to thank this family that you can be together here. Mm -hmm. I think uh, up till a few months ago, you thought that this will never be possible. Mm -hmm. And what was not possible for us, it was possible for God. Yeah. And so we... <laughs> the most incredible experience to know God is in control and he can do wonderful things. Yeah. I'm so dumbstruck, I'm being honest. I, uh, I'm very pleased that everything comes, all bad things comes to an end and something new born out of that and which is good because yeah. God is good. Peace, Peace. for this family. Yeah. Oh. Yes. I feel good, great, yeah, I'm happy. Oh. Oh, no, no. Burden has been off my shoulders. Yeah, yeah. I am I just want to say that the, the daughter that was five years old at the time, after the VOG, I asked them questions about their experience. And she said she can't go wait to go to school the next day. And I asked her why. And she said, now I can tell my friends that I've got a daddy. Because this was the first time that she saw her father after 10 years. That is why... I wrote a letter to the area commissioner of that specific management area and requested for them to bring the offender in private clothes for the sake of that girl that was five years old. And I didn't want her to see her father in an orange uniform after he killed her mother. I had to look at the merit of any case. Uh, he killed her mother. She already lost a mother. Now she's going to see her father after 10 years in an orange uniform. And I requested them to send him in private clothes. 
and that is why he is in, in private place. Okay, now I'm not gonna give you that information, but just also in terms of the murders and the family, there you see 12,218 people were raped um, between October and December last year. That's the latest stats. Over 4,900 of rape incident took place in the home of, of the victim or the home of the rapist. 570 were domestic violence related. Then the gender-based violence, there is now 129 more lifers in prison because of gender-based violence, violence within the family. We already, we only had in 1994, 455 lifers in prison. By 2014, we had about 12,000 lifers. I think it's now by 16,000 lifers. Crisis, crime is increasing. We need to come alongside our victims. We need to come alongside our communities. We need to look at the roots of the crime and most of the roots of the crime, unfortunately, stems from the broken homes and dysfunctional families. So some of the theory I will share with you here and um, I want to hear from you um, our next step, then I will continue with this, but. What we're gonna do, and I want to make do more justice to this, I'm gonna give a training that we use internationally about victim offender mediation and dialogue, um, what it's all about, the uh, crime that is personalized. We're gonna look at the mediation and the dialogue, the below voluntary process, um, and also the facilitator as a mediator. We're gonna look at the course that we will present to you how to go about with it, especially when it comes to the hurt and the pain of the lost. We will look at the dialogue. The dialogue is an open-ended communication. Um, when we look at the, uh, some of the examples with the police saga, um, the mental uh, state of the offender, um, that's, we're gonna talk a lot about that because that question comes a lot on and there are even offenders that share about how they were brutally assaulted over their heads and had some challenges there. So they also victims of crime. Um, the question is, um, while the process is victim initiated, the, um, the offenders participate is voluntary, okay? So the question is, are victims or offenders required to do this? Never. It's all voluntary. You can't force anybody to do anything. Um, and if you want a report, definitely I shared with you um, what is needed for that. So we're going to look at all that. But I just want to come to, uh, for, the sake of, for the sake of time, I want to come to some of the uh, information that is also important that who makes a good facilitator? We will talk about that. Um, we will talk of a co-mediation uh, person, uh, um, um, uh, uh, the preparation for that and the mediation process. What is there that we need to have in place for the VOD? I even, I even brought in good lightning, air conditioning. We had once a victim in a little small room and she asked, is the murderer gonna come and sit with me in this room? So we need to, to work out our therapeutic venues and we're gonna look at the, the, the mediation process where the parties discuss things in general, um, airing their emotions, how we're gonna look at their emotions. So there's quite a number of things that we still need to do. We're gonna look at the success is, uh, is more than problem solving. Um, so also um, the value of the reconciliation, um, mediatable issues will be discussed, especially the emotions. Any issue that uh, really matters to someone needs to be included. Um, so um, you picked up certain emotions, uh, eye contact. Uh, and now the other day, a, a, a mother was sharing face-to-face uh, -to, -face to her ex-husband how he killed his own biological son. And the emotions of the daughter I could pick up and I asked the daughter to, to share what she wanted to share at the time of her emotions and it came out very powerful. 
Um, so there are many, many um, other sessions and we will give you the, the date for that. So we will work towards that as well. But um, for the last few minutes, I just want to, 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 to bring to your attention in terms of um, what the way forward, okay? Now, looking at the way forward, if we accept the VOD as a way forward, then we obviously has to get involved with the restorative justice process. So the implementation of the victim offender dialogue forum, um, and, 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 and one of the things that, that I found when, when correctional services work on their own about these processes, then it just stagnates somewhere. But where correctional services make use of their stakeholders and we do things together, I experience it's working. Because correctional services also try to, 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 to do the restorative justice many years ago, even on their own, even start working out their own document with 80% of our information. And it was never successful because you can't work without your partners. And so the DCS plus stakeholders is important. We need to look at VOD policies and procedures. We need to come back to Imbisos to, 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 to inform the community, identify offenders for restorative justice, the offenders to sign up for the RJ process, identify victims, and then the victim offender dialogue forum. So I suggest before we expand on this slide, I suggest that we have an, not just another, we will have more victim offender dialogue training because there's a lot to speak about. I am uh, I'm fascinated by reading up about these processes and not just the theories. I'm not too much uh, with the theories alone Every theory that I find, even what DCS wrote many years ago, I bring it to the centers and we test it in a restorative justice process, in a victim offender dialogue process. So most of my in information sharing with you are information that we as a team gathered from the offenders, from the victims, from the community. And so it is not just theory alone. So um, we need to continue with more training. There is more information. We're going to look at bringing victims of crime on board and that they can share with us. So I'm gonna do a clip about VOD, then the victims is going to respond to that. And they're gonna share with us where they feel we're failing them because they're gonna be the voice of victims that don't have a voice at this point in time. So that is where we're going. So Didi, yes, we're gonna have uh, more seminars, more training, whatever we're gonna call it, more discussions. But furthermore, what we're also going to do um, is we're going to get into our cars and we're going to get some information from centers and you're gonna give us information, whatever information you have of offenders that did the restorative justice process, that if you have details of the victims and the address, we're gonna get into our vehicles and we're going to have onboard training for people that go with me and see how I approach the victims, what is the process that I use. Um, this is a, 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 a pilot project that I did with the Swedish team, they were 11 people that came for training for the VOD. And, uh, and at the end of it, um, I will go into the homes, I will speak to the family, I'll tell the family then who the people is there out in the cars. And then they said, no, they can come in. And that's the time that, that I engage with the families and they standing there, not just to listen and experience and observe, but they also became very, 
caring for the for the victims that that broke down and the victims really appreciated that as well so there's going to be training in that way in a practical way so um, that's what we're going to do and Didi your loving husband experienced that with me so he can tell you more about his experience too so that is where we are. This is not the first time that Inga will let you know when our next meeting is. So we're waiting now for responses from you via email. Do you want to get on board? Do you want to be invited when we speak again? The training is going to continue. There is more to do until we get on the streets and get our hands dirty. Um, so uh, can I hear from you in a minute maybe if anybody want to give a feedback anybody want to give a feedback we've got three more minutes left southern cape thank you reverend from the side of the southern cape we really want to thank you for a very very informative uh, session and like you always know that we stay in contact with you regarding the VOD training, VOM training, and, and also the processes that we need to follow. But we will uh, send you an email and we don't want to be left out for future uh, uh, even virtual training or man-to-man -man training. We don't want to be left out, but we want, really want to thank you on the side of the Southern Cape for a very much informative uh, session that we did have now. Thank you very much, Mr. LaRue and Mr. Rampasan and the whole team in, in Guru. I mean, at, at George, and then also know that let's 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 creep through the month of May because from the first of April, it's not April Fool; it's the new financial year of correctional services. So, um, if you could get into that boardroom, tell Mrs. Boy, I say thank you very much for her approval. Also, if you could get there, the entire management area in the boardroom there, then maybe we can drive down and have a session there in the boardroom. Thank you, Pastor. It's noted, um, and Area Commissioner is fully aware of this session. Uh, yes, she has given us the go ahead. You know, she's she's always into it. So um, we will do that. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else that want to make a final remark? Brother? Yes, sir. Just, just um, yeah, very, I'm also very excited by the fact that the Southern Cape all joined us. They, they always take part in things and just thank you to them. Um, but also just with this training was struck earlier by the, the, the fact that the cops, the SAPs, the police stations, their trauma counselors and the police, um, gotta be, I don't know if they are as well equipped as they could be in terms of handling victims and trauma. And I think you know, if we could break into to that area as well and training former counsellors and being involved with SAF because they often the first point of call for victims and for them to be able to know how to handle the victims properly would be great. So this, I mean, it would be interesting to look at that for this training as well. Thank you, Luke. Two things in, in my notes, I've got a lot of um, information about the challenges within the police and, 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 and they're not they're not really equipped and ready for, for victim empowerment and victim support. And I received the invitation from the provincial office of, of the police to get on board with uh, victim offender um, training. And so I, I, I was asking them uh, where, where is the most important area and they said, uh, Steenburg. And, and I said that I'm staying five minutes almost away from the Steenburg police station. So the community where I'm staying in um, need a lot of training for and, and support for victims. So yeah, so uh, we will definitely look into that look. And yes, we're going to get the police also on board and social services in our training so that we want correctional services to share with social services and the police and the Department of Justice where they struggle in terms of this areas of victim tracing and, 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 and all that and so on. So this is gonna be a continuous uh, um, training in this area and bringing the right people on board. I'm now well connected with the provincial office of the police as well.